Okay, I think we'll get started. So uh, thanks everyone for coming. I know it's late in the day. It's been a long two or three days. Um, my name's Ian Houston. I'm going to talk a little bit today about operationalizing data science on CF. Now, what I mean by that is trying to move data science models from you know, some data scientist's laptop where it works there and try and get them in production. Um, and I'm not coming with like, all the answers now. Um, you know, some, some of these things are things we've tried. Um, some are th questions I have about you know, what other people have tried and, and trying to figure out, start a conversation about what sh we should do in the future as well. Get this to actually work. Oops. Okay. Chrome uh, not working very well for this. Okay, there we go. And um, so, who am I? So, I'm a data scientist working uh, at Pivotal Labs, working with clients, uh, doing predictive analytics and machine learning type projects. <laughs> um, but I'm also a Cloud Foundry user. I've been using uh, CF for you know two or three years now. And I got so far as I've actually written a build pack. So I've got like quite far into the you know, uh, process of how do you stage an app and how do you um, make your applications run on Cloud Foundry. So hopefully I've been able to bring a little bit of that to, to bear today in this talk. Um, and what we're really going to be talking about is how do we get those uh, sort of machine learning and predictive analytics smarts into applications. And the reason this is important is because it's kind of becoming the expectation that you know, everyone wants to see, as, as Mark Benioff said recently, everyone wants to see uh, systems and applications that are smarter, that have more predictive capabilities, and they want things scored and you know, to see the next best opportunity, next best offer. And basically, they want their applications to get smarter. You know, at the moment, we, we might call these smart apps, these sort of things that have um, this extra machine learning inside them. But very soon, we're probably just going to call them apps. So it's just going to be expected by you know, consumers and business users that their applications have these kind of capabilities. So what's the, the problem at the moment? Well, really, um, if your machine learning model is to provide any business value, it has to go into production. A lot of um, data science up to now has been in the sort of exploratory mode. So uh, you give your data scientists some data, they go off and they do some analysis, they might come up with some toy models, maybe something that does work on their laptop. Um, but that, if that only lives, ever lives in a presentation or uh, lives in a, a report, then it's not actually providing real business value. So you know, kind of the way to think about this is a, you know, you're investing a lot in your data scientists. If this, their output, if their work is not really making it into production, then you're not getting the business value out of that. So slide decks uh, don't count as production as well. So that's, you know, um, a few people sort of think that, but it's not quite true. Um, and a lot of people have this problem, you know, sure, data scientists have the problem. We want to see impact uh, for the work we're doing. We don't want, uh, you know, our kind of uh, complicated predictive model to just lie on a shelf somewhere and never to be used. And developers are starting to feel the need to uh, include these kind of capabilities into their applications. We're seeing the sort of growth of an ecosystem. Um, Google earlier talked about some of their machine learning APIs. And uh, so making it easier for developers to add this capability. Um, and you've got like CIOs, chief data officers, they've invested quite heavily in sort of big data space and now they want to see some return on that. And you know, the only way that the return is really going to exist is if these models get put uh, into production, if they're actually part of the systems that are working. You know, and, and Pivotal Labs, we see um, quite a few of our clients are starting out on their journey uh, on, this, on this path and want to implement their first machine learning models and want to see the, the results they can get. So this is very important for them that you know, what we're building with them isn't just this one-off experiment, experiment that uh, you know, we, don't, you know, we, we do it, we stop, and then move on. This is something that actually lives and, and can contribute. So to do all of that, you need um, a few things. The first thing you need is you need a way to actually run your model. So you know, this kind of day one problem, what's the first thing you need to do? Well, we need to run the, the predictive model. It may, you know, you, data scientists put a lot of effort into building it, um, but now it has to go and, and run for real. So there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, I'm not going to talk about each of these in turn, but the kind of part of that process is loading and transforming the data. 
and training the model. In, in machine learning, we normally have these training phases and scoring phases. So actually training the model, the learn, that's the actual learning part. When we actually connect it to real incoming data, and that you know, sounds simple, but in a, in a complex system, that could be one of the hardest parts, cleaning and transforming that data so it's in the right form to, to go into the predictive model. Actually applying that model, which again, maybe sounds easy, oh, you, you just you know, got some, basically some mathematical uh, formula, you just apply it and run, run the uh, new data through it. But you know, there's a whole load of things around that um, in terms of you know, just the computation side, but also uh, simple things like library versioning and that kind of thing. And then finally, you take some action. So you know, that can take a multiple, of, uh, multiple forms. Maybe it's you, you, know, you show someone the next best offer. You show someone the recommended uh, video that they should watch. Or you do something else, like you increase their quality of service. Or you, uh, you know, maybe you don't do anything because they, you've predicted they're going to churn and you don't actually want to keep them as a customer. So it's kind of an absence of action. So these are all the things you need to do, even just to have anything in production. And I'm going to run through a few really high-level kind of, maybe architecture is too grand a word for, for the next few slides, but a few, few high-level ideas about um, how to do this on Cloud Foundry. And these kind of follow this typical way that machine learning and predictive analytics models get, uh, get put into production. So you know, the first one is kind of a, a scoring as a service. So in this case, you're building your model somewhere else, maybe on some kind of big data system, some kind of distributed cluster type thing, and using a lot of, lot of data over there. The output of that is something you store um, you know, on a data service, you know, Redis or something like that in Cloud Foundry. And then you're ingesting the data in CF, you're applying the model inside an application, you know, uh, maybe these are separate applications, an ingest one and, a, and an ap apply or score mod uh, application. And then you do something, whether that's through your front end or connecting to some business uh, sort of back end system, you do something. So this is kind of like a, the simplest thing you can do. Um, all the, you, know, it, you could argue that all the hard work is being done in this kind of gray box in the bottom left, which is actually doing the, the predictive part. Um, and then you're just using the results of that on Cloud Foundry. And, um, Yesterday, uh, I was doing a talk about build packs, and I showed it, uh, a demo, which was like a, a sentiment analysis model that had been pre-built somewhere else, and then we uh, pushed it to, to CF, and we were able to send it you know, new, new text and see what the sentiment, positive or negative, was for that text. So that's kind of an example of this first case. The next case is something much more like, uh, well, it, it includes CF in the, the building part. So this is something I kind of called CF-powered learning. We need to come up with a better name, maybe. Here, you're ingesting all the data through Cloud Foundry, so um, using something maybe like Spring Cloud Dataflow or something to, to transform it and, and you know, get uh, st different streams. And then you're building the model. Maybe it's on a Cloud Foundry application instance. Maybe it's uh, a CF app controlling something else, like sending you know, command and control to your other big data system. And then there's still this batch update of the model that's stored somewhere and is uh, applied by another application instance. So that batch update normally happens at relatively low frequency compared to the new data that's coming in. Um, but you have to you know, start thinking about you know, how do you do this update? How does your app know that there's a new version of the model to download or use? Um, and how, you know, how do you keep all this in sync? And you can imagine, you know, if you've started looking at microservices architecture, you can squint and imagine like different services uh, being composed of the different parts here. I'm going to uh, run through a video later of an example of uh, a predictive model that uses this kind of architecture where we have three different uh, microservices. So one is the training application, one is the scoring application, and one's kind of the front end, or how do we, how do we show those results. And one more uh, sort of high level way of doing this is to not have the, the batch building of the model. So you have much more of a, it's called online or uh, in-stream learning. So as the data is coming in, you're updating the model as you go. And um, so this poses a lot of challenges that conceptually might look simple on the, on the screen, but it's actually probably the hardest one to do from a, an algorithmic point of view. Because you don't, get, the idea behind this is you don't get to see the data. You don't get to keep it. You just see it as it goes past you once. So you have to do like, uh, single pass algorithms. You don't get to go back and look through the whole data set again. 
So this is, you know, Google's been doing a lot of work in this area as well, and you know, there's a good few blog posts about this where they talk about you have to be really careful about the timing of the ingest of the data, because if you don't get it in the right order, you might have to reorder it yourself in order to, uh, in order to apply your algorithm, which is expecting things in a particular maybe date time kind of order. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, you know, you can build it yourself. Um, I've been using things like Spring Cloud Dataflow uh, and Spring Boot applications to actually build these kind of infrastructures for some clients. Um, you obviously make use of the marketplace data services. Today we had uh, a really good talk about, again, about Google's uh, services in this area being available now through a service broker. Um, and you know, as a data scientist, I'm often using Python and building these Python uh, models. So being able to deploy those to Cloud Foundry is really important as well. And, and you know, the official Python build pack now has this ability to deploy kind of the PyData stack, which is kind of the standard packages for Python, um, which it wasn't able to do previously. There's also some initial offerings in this kind of area from you know, GE Predix, IBM's Bluemix has some of this stuff. I know Alpine uh, Data Miner have started looking at this. They've um, you know, got, kind of got a, like a publish to CF button that uses PMML, which is a kind of open, interoperable data model format. PMML has its issues, and they're actually moving to a new format called uh, PAF, Predictive Analytic Framework, or something. So there's a di few different options, probably at this point. Um, you know, no one's standardized in any particular one, and building it yourself for your particular use case is probably, uh, sort of, if you weigh it up, is probably the best bet at the moment. Okay, so I'm gonna try and look at this video. Um, so this is an application that was built by uh, Pivotal Labs, some of our team, um, and it's basically an accelerometer in your phone taking sensor readings from your phone and building a model of um, what activity you are doing at any moment. And you can see here our lovely volunteer is gonna first of all link his phone into the uh, application. There's actually just one uh, front-end app that's doing what you see on the mobile and uh, browser, desktop browser. And it's gonna use, as I said, the accelerometer in the phone. And this is an example of that uh, CF powered learning uh, model that I, I showed earlier. So here we're training the model. So we're gonna give it some data, it's gonna store that data, and it's gonna build a model from that data. Here he's walking in place, and you can see the kind of, <laughs> that, that timer is just telling you how much data you have to generate before we're gonna be able to uh, recognize that in the future. He's very, very happy about this. So, <laughs> um, so you know, these are this is a fairly simple example in terms of uh, the, you know, the activities he's doing, but you can imagine something like a fitness tracker um, using these kind of predictive models to determine, oh, are you, you, know, are you taking 10,000 steps a day or are you actually sitting in a cab and pretending to take 10,000 steps? So you know, we're going side to side. He's basically doing a little dance and we're going to, you know, it's called the Pivotal Moves app, but we could have called it Pivotal, Pivotal Dance Moves app maybe. Um, and you know what we'll uh, what we we'll get to is the point where we're able to hit the the build the model button. And what's going to happen there is um, the front end app is going to hand off to that training app um, that's sitting in the background. That's actually going to do the predictive analytics. So it's going to be using a uh, random forest uh, ensemble of decision trees uh, to take in the uh, accelerometer input and then predict one of these three outputs. So it's a classification problem here. So, you know, he's trained all the, uh, got some training data now, we can build the model, goes off, builds it, and comes back, yeah. And then we can now go to the scoring phase. So this is kind of, as new data comes in now, what happens? And you can see, as he's standing there, you can see the big caption at the top says, walking in place, and you can see the accelerometer details. <coughs> he switches to moving side by side, and as the scoring phase happens, it uh, changes to side by side there. So it's determining as he's going, um, what, what the uh, activities are. So that's kind of a, a really good example of the, uh, that kind of CF-driven learning um, because all of the, the whole uh, thing lived there on Cloud Foundry. So that's great, we've got our model, it's working, it's in production, it's taking in real data. What do we need to do next? Well, day two, you want to update the model. You've figured out something else, you want to change the parameters, you want to use a different type of model. 
Um, and you suddenly start getting a few problems, like you now need to know which predictions were made with the old model and the new model. So, you know, if you're storing these for some kind of auditability later, um, you need to know, did you uh, predict that this person could have a mortgage or could not? Which version of the model were you using to do that when the auditor comes along to ask you questions? Um, do you need to be able to continue serving the old predictions? Is it important that that old version of the model is still available to maybe consumers who, uh, you know, in whatever form have, have built against that old version? And maybe, you know, some, maybe you're building this for customers and some of them want to move to the new version and some want to move to the old version. Kind of like Spotify bring in a new uh, prediction algorithm for what songs you're going to like. Maybe some people want to stay on the old one. There's a whole, you know, usual problem of dependency management. Um, so that needs to be looked at. And also de sort of data schema changes. So it's, is the data that's coming in different to previously? Has it changed in the under underlying system? Is the data you're storing changed? Are you doing some different transformation? Um, and can you replay the stream if necessary? So if someone comes back to you and says, okay, why did we, why did we uh, decide that this person liked this song? This person could have this mortgage. This person's card transaction was denied. Can we replay it so that we understand what decisions were made? You know, some predictive models have more explainability than others, so um, sometimes you can get that uh, sort of out of the predictive model, but you're not going to need to have the inputs and you're going to need to have them all versioned. So, you know, to me this kind of starts looking like, okay, we can't just um, do as was done in that, in that demo, uh, store a model as a, you know, an object, uh, a serialized object in some data store, maybe in Redis or something, then pull it out and use it again. Maybe we need something more. Maybe we need... Um, you know, something like a model service, something that, you know, when you ask for uh, the results or when you ask for the model, it gives you the right one for your use case. Maybe it's versioned, maybe it's parsing data with different schema, it kind of has that, you know, ability to deal with legacy data. And um, maybe it's, you know, as I said, serving the appropriate version depending on who's consuming it. Um, and it's possibly storing the underlying data in some more general form or an unstructured form so that you're able to retrain and uh, reproduce the results later on. I don't think there's anything like this quite yet on Cloud Foundry, um, but there's a few other uh, things out there that's kind of going in this direction. There's a project called Palladium from the Otto Group um, that did something sort of like this. You could send it and you get a version of your model. And um, Prediction I.O., which I think was just bought by Salesforce, but also the, so the technology has just been donated to the Apache Foundation, so it's Apache Prediction I.O. incubating. Um, they have something like this, it's, but it's a whole system itself. So, um, you know, they have a server, I don't quite know what the underlying technology is, but um, you can implement sort of uh, replaceable algorithms as little uh, extensions effectively. So it kind of, you know, I, I think some people have looked in the past at moving that onto Cloud Foundry, like would it work in that kind of, uh, would we be able to deploy it as a service or an application on CF? I think didn't go very far with that one, so maybe there's a need for someone to build something more general that could be reusable in different scenarios here. So that's kind of like, you know, my, my <laughs> hope for this talk maybe is to start a conversation about what, what is needed here um, I have a few ideas myself, but I'd like to hear from other people who kind of need this uh, functionality. How, how do we make it? Um, and kind of more generally, what's next for, for doing data science on Cloud Foundry? I think we're still you know, very much at the beginning of this journey, um, even just given by the number of talks at this summit about sort of data science topics. There's a lot now about IoT, and you know, suddenly this year there's a lot more sort of ingesting of IoT data. Um, and, you know, immediately the sort of thing that screams at you then is, okay, we need to do something with all this uh, baggage tag data, for example, that we heard about earlier. Um, so to do that, we kind of need a few things. Um, we probably need more data services and maybe more data computation services. Um, so I know there's you know, a few different uh, projects to incorporate Spark into kind of a CF workflow and some other uh, distributed computation systems. We need more... Uh, examples of how this works, some demos, I'm trying to collect some of those and uh, sort of make them available to the community or like just list them. Um, we need some examples of successful projects, where has this worked, uh, sort of hopefully next time at the CF Summit there'll be someone doing a talk about you know, a project where they've used Cloud Foundry with machine learning and be uh, useful for the community to learn from that. 
And I think we also need to start building some of these building blocks um, so that you know, they're a little bit easier to get started on this, that not everyone's reinventing the wheel every time that they want to build something like this and have, you know, have this capability of having this model service. Um, so that's really all I've got. I was, uh, yeah, this dsoncf.com thing is kind of this list of examples um, that I've found of data science. If anyone has any other examples, please let me know, uh, either on the website or via Twitter. Um, but apart from that, just thank you very much for being here. Does anyone have any questions? No? All, yep. I don't know. I, I don't think there's any limit on the, the kind of learning you can do. So if you think about, you know, CF at a, a sort of basic level, it's just, you know, another compute system in some ways. So you know, as long as you can get the data in, you can do something to it and restore that result, do some training. Like, I think the limitations are, there's some t technical limitations. So if you want to do, you know, a very large batch training over terabytes of data, doing that on a single application instance in CF is probably not the way to do that. Um, maybe in the future, you know, with things like the, uh, um, oh, what's the name of the, the feature where you get a, you can have different zones of uh, computational power? Isolation segments. So with the isolation segments, you might be able to hive off a part that's like very high-powered machines for your uh, data science work and keep your, you know, relatively smaller machines for your, just your web apps. Um, so there's a few different things. We were talking earlier about tasks, I think, as well, uh, being a really good way of like r running a one-off like training. Um, so when these come into to CF proper, it's going to be interesting to see how they can be used in the data science context. Any other questions? No? Okay, thanks everyone.